Well, hey, great to see you and excited that you're a part of, that you're here, that you're a part of this service that we're about to have or we've been having and going to be, you know, finished up here shortly. But anyway, hey, great to see you. If you're new with us, my name's Phil. I'm one of the pastors here. And today we are about halfway through a study that we've been on and a journey we've been on uh, through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians. Now, uh, my family, one of the movie series that we have watched for several years now is probably one that many of you have seen or at least are somewhat familiar with, and that's the, and that's the movie series uh, Madagascar, and there, there's a series of different, um, uh, you know, sequels that, that have gone along with it, even spinoffs, and just, uh, you know, full transparency, I think the Penguin spinoff is by far the best out of all those movies, and those are actually my favorite characters in the whole thing, the Penguins, I love the Penguins, I didn't care as much for the animals, I like the Penguins, or the, you know, the other ones, but at, at any rate, if you're not familiar with the Madagascar series, it's really focused is on four animals specifically, a giraffe, a zebra, a lion, and a hippopotamus. And each one of them has their own little peculiarities. You know, for example, you got the giraffe that has an anxiety disorder. You have the hippopotamus that's all into, what in the first one, into mani-pedis, uh, massages, things along those lines. You got a lion who can dance and seemingly sing, or at the very least, he kind of roars, but he doesn't really roar. He gets steaks fed to him. And and then you got the zebra that's more of like a hype man, and, and so he's got a lot of energy. And you got these four animals that are in the New York City Zoo, and as they're in this zoo, they're in the confines of the zoo, uh, one of the least wild and, you know, uh, African areas that you could probably be in, and, and that's where they're at. And it's there that they have cages, and the people come and they take pictures of them, and there's, there's nothing at all to be worried about. But at any rate, as they're in this zoo, the zebra gets gets the, the notion or the idea comes into his mind that maybe, just maybe, there is more out there for them to experience. That maybe, just maybe, they were meant for a little bit more. That maybe they're not living out the, the full life that they ought to be living in the confines of this space, of this zoo. It just seems like there was more there for them. And in the process of all that, they become very, very domesticated. And I, I think that that, for many of us, uh, definitely for myself, is a good description of where we are with our Christian faith. Like, if we were just to be honest, like, there's a lot of us who are pretty domesticated with our faith. And, I, and I'm not just saying, like, hey, you should go do these things. You should go be a missionary, and you should go, uh, you know, play in a church or go into vocational ministry and give up everything you've got to the poor. I'm not, that's not where I'm going with this, because that's what a lot of us think whenever we think of um, maybe, maybe getting a little bit wild with our faith. But those animals realized that they were meant for more, that they were made for more, that there was more out there. They just, they just couldn't quite get to it, and eventually they ultimately do. And one of my challenges for us today is to hopefully take a step. I mean, my challenge or my goal is just to give you a nudge every, every weekend, even give myself a nudge in the journey that we are on with Christ. And so my hope is today that we'll take that nudge to maybe get out of the confines of, of the safety and the security and everything else that we have, that we've created that's been given to us because that's, that's not exactly what you were made for. In fact, you were made for so much more. You've been destined for so much more. And that's what Paul prays about in Ephesians chapter 3. At the, at the end of this chapter, he is, he's praying a prayer of sanctification. He's not, he's not praying, and this isn't for people that don't believe in Jesus, although if you don't believe in Jesus, I think it definitely will give you some perspective on, on what exactly the, the Christian faith is, is meant to be about. But, but for the rest of us, he's praying this prayer of sanctification. Now, one of the concerns that I have for us who are meant to be followers of Jesus is that we don't concern ourselves enough with sanctification. Sanctification is, if you aren't familiar with the word, it's, it's essentially you becoming more like Jesus. It's you dying to yourself to follow him. And it's that process. Now, we do like justification. We pay attention to that. That's essentially us going from being, from being lost to being saved or being uh, condemned to being forgiven. That, that, that's what justification is. And we like glorification. Glorification is the reunification of our, of our resurrected body with our spirit as Jesus returns and makes a new heaven and a new earth. We understand glorification. We like God's sovereignty because there's so much of our lives in this world that's out of our control. It's nice to know that there's someone who is still in control. But sanctification 
is where we live and breathe and have our being. Sanctification is the space between belief and death. That's where we live the majority of our lives as Christians. But, but we just haven't quite gotten out into the wild. We, we have settled into comfort and convenience, and, and we're really more focused on maintaining that than becoming who it is that we are meant to be and, and living out this faith that we have. Now, some of the ways that you know that you've gotten a little bit too domesticated with your faith, some of the ways that, that you might recognize just that Paul prays against, and there, I think there's other signs that you become too domesticated with your faith, but, but Paul Paul is going to pray against these specific things. And w one of the first ones is, is that your strength is found in external things. Where does your strength come from? Often it comes from our security cameras. <laughs> and, that, that, and it comes from money in a bank account. It comes from a title. It comes from our, our str physical strength. It comes from our beauty. And that's a different kind of strength. That's not the strength that, that what we're going to get at here, the strength that really matters, that's going to matter for you and for me. Now, often our strength is found in these things around us that, that just fade or, or reality is are pretty uncertain. Another, another way to know that your, your faith is too domesticated is, is that your relationship with Christ has limits. It's based upon how good you are how, and, and how much you avoid being bad. And so you got to do certain things and not do certain things. And as long as you're doing these things and not doing these other things in this transactional relationship is possible, then, then you have a relationship. But, but that relationship has limits. And what Paul is going to be praying about is how his love is so all-encompassing. It's not about what we do, but it's about who he is. And another way that you know your faith is too domesticated is that you find yourself wanting more of the wrong things. There is a lot more for us to experience. And in fact, we're gonna read a verse in a moment that says God is willing to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. But often, the more that we want, more affection, more attention, more money, more leisure, more fun, all of those things that we want are not necessarily the more that he's guaranteeing us. But you know what? That's what the more that everybody else around us wants. That's the, we want the same more that everybody else in the world wants often. And they don't believe anything. And they believe different. They don't, they don't believe in any sort of Jesus. They don't believe anything aligned with the scriptures or at least hardly believe that. And yet we all want the same thing. And all that means is we're justified, but we're not really moving on a path of, being sanctified. And so Paul, he's going to pray this prayer, and then the, the book of Ephesians turns a corner, and it goes from theology to application. And so he's going to pray this incredible prayer. He's going to call us all out into more. He's going to cast then a vision. And the more vision, the vision of the more that he offers us is a vision of being humble, and of being gentle, and of not being given over to drunkenness or sexual immorality, of loving your wife the way that Christ loved the church, of, of submitting to a husband as a spiritual leader, of, of obeying your parents and not exasperating your children. He offers us a vision of more that, well, it's a, quite a bit different than then maybe the vision from the messages that were given all around us. And that is pretty wild, honestly. And so it's that that brings us into this passage of Scripture that I'm going to read to you, and then I'm going to go back and break it down for you. And we're going to talk about how to undomesticate our faith. And I do realize undomesticate is not a word, but sometimes I just make words up. So at any rate, for this reason, everything that I've essentially just said to you, I kneel before the Father, and so Paul talks about kneeling. He has a, a humble disposition when he comes into a moment of prayer as it relates to what it is that, that he is going to pray for these people. It's not that you always have to pray, uh, pray on your knees, but there is a certain spirit of humility that ought to always be present. And then who are you praying to? Are you praying to this omnipotent one that wants nothing to do with you? Are you praying to one who created you but has, is far away like an agnostic? Are you, are you praying to maybe the some energy that's out there? 
No. He's praying to a father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. He's praying of one personal God. Not, not, not as many would say in the world that, well, that God is this way and their, that God, their God is that way and this God over here is this way, but they're all really kind of the same. They're not. There's one God whom all the families on heaven and earth, in other words, everyone who has lived or is living comes from this one God. And then he says, I pray that. Now this that word is very important. There's five that's in this. We're going to focus on four of them. And it's each one of those that that's that's known as a purpose clause. And each one of these clauses builds on itself to get to God doing abundantly more than you could ever imagine. Now, who doesn't want God to do abundantly more than we could ever imagine? I think all of us do. But we often come to church feeling like, God, you're not doing enough. God, you're coming up short. We may not say it like that, but we feel that. We don't feel like God's doing enough for us. But we aren't wanting enough of the right more. And the reality is, is like we're not wanting these other things that lead up to him doing abundantly more than we could ever imagine. It's us experiencing the fruit of true sanctification. I pray that out of his glorious riches. Did you know that God is so rich? And if, and if we could just go, like just imagine your ATM or your bank. You go to that bank and you draw out money. We can draw out from heaven blessing. We can draw out from heaven fruitfulness. We can draw out from heaven that sanctification in essence. We can draw out, but just like that ATM, you got to have the right pen. You got you to have the right, you got to be approaching it the right way. Glorious riches that he may strengthen you. So he wants to give you strength with power through his spirit in your inner being. Often we focus on the outside though, don't we? Maybe, what if, and I've said this before, but what if God were more concerned about our character than our careers? If we embrace that, then we would understand what he's getting at here, that he's really worried about your inner being, not whatever it is that's around you that's so concerning you. His spirit in your inner being so that, so that you can be rich or so that you can get more of more attention or more respect? No. You know why he wants you to have a great inner being? So that Christ may dwell in your heart. Not because of how good you are, but instead because of your faith. And then he goes, here's another perfect clause. I pray that. Being rooted and established in love. You may have power together with all Lord's holy people to grasp. And you want to know how? You want to know why that relationship doesn't have limits with God? Because his love doesn't have limits. To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. It's a love that we can't quite get our minds around. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, then, in light of all of that, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power, that is at work within us, to him be the glory. Often the more that we want is about our glory. Why does he want to give you more than you could ever imagine? For his glory that can happen in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, not just the past, not just the future, but even as bad as you think it is right now. Even as bad as it is, or even as bad as it could get, like he still can get glory through all of that forever and ever. Amen. That's incredible to think about. And so how do we undomesticate our faith? Well, where did he start? I'm going to go back and break it all down for you a little bit beyond what I just did. I'll read it again to you, verse 14 through 16. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every heaven, family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that you, that out of his glorious riches, you may be, you may, that he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. You know what he is most concerned about right here, according to this? Our inner strength. Again, we like to get our strength from the outside and, and what's going on around us or, or what's on the periphery. But what he is most concerned about is what's on the inside. Because who we are on the inside is really 
who we are. Now, I don't know how you function in this space, but often I'll have things inside of me kind of warring and battling that aren't necessarily good. And what he's saying is, is like, you need to have an inner strength. You need to have, let's say it this way, God's truth consuming you. Because you can look fine on the outside. And it's not just looking fine to the world. That's not what we're talking about. Looking fine to God. Looking fine to other Christians. Like we can do the, we can say the right words. We can show up to church sometimes. We can maybe serve a little bit. We can give a little bit. We can do these different things. But again, he wants that to flow out of what's inside of us. And he wants a congruency between that outer, outer faith and, and what's going on inside of us, not an incongruency. And one of the greatest ways that we can get our internal life right, that inner strength that he's praying about here, that we would have that inner strength, is to have God's truth ruling inside of us. Do you have like this simmering anger in you? Do you have this simmering anxiety that just keeps bubbling up? Do you have these lustful inhibitions that you don't have control over? These, uh, you know, the ambition that's just out of control in you? And, and it's just got you all out of sorts? That's hard to have peace and it's hard to have inner strength whenever those things are ruling your insides. But he's saying, like, if we can just have more of God's truth in us, then then it's then that we can process our anxiety through his truth, our anger through his truth, lustfulness or ambition through our truth, or, or whatever it might exactly be for you. I liken it in the way that we get this. We have these available to us beyond what we can imagine. Talk about more than you can imagine. We have more Bibles than we could ever imagine. I, I've read a, I read a, um, one statistic that said the average American home has like 3.5 Bibles in it or something, and you're thinking like, how is that possible? Well, I got like 20 in mine, so definitely I'm making up for some of you. But we got this available to us, but we don't intake it. We don't have the input to have the right output. It's like my cell phone. I'll have my cell phone sitting right next to the charger, and then I won't charge it. And then I pick it up a few hours later, and it's almost dead, and I'm thinking, it was right there. But because they weren't connected, then the inside of that phone didn't get the charge. And so now it's, it's kind of useless. We've got this right next to us. But we've got to connect to it to allow it to change us to where we can be useful, to where we can, again, be a little wild. As you grow older, it's been said, you can become spiritually stronger. And I hope, I hope and pray that that is true of you. And I certainly think back in my early 20s, and I was battling things inside of me that I just, I'm like, I thought there was no way I'm ever going to get a handle on this. And I'm kind of in 42, so I'm kind of right there in the middle. And I'm thinking, well, it's not quite what it was. And my faith, thankfully, isn't what it was. But that's the journey that we're on. And even though outwardly we may be wasting away, as Paul says, inwardly we are being renewed day by day, and that inner strength is what matters, and it matters more and more as life goes on. Coming back into our text, why is it that you want to have a strong inner strength? Well, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, the indwelt Christ. So you have, first of all, an inner strength. Secondly, he prays, for you to have an indwelt, indwelt Christ. Now, what in the world does that mean? What the heck? Indwelt Christ? Are you serious? No, this is what that really, well, this is what he's getting at. Really what's focused there is that word dwell. The word dwell in the Greek is kateo kio, and that that's just translates into dwell, but it also, it's really two words essentially that mean make yourself at home. Would Christ, here's the question for us, would Christ be comfortable dwelling in, in our hearts. Would Christ, if he were to come, into, come inside of us, would he be comfortable with being there? For many of us, and for me at many times, he wouldn't be. There's an, if, let me illustrate it this way. In the Old Testament, you've got Abraham, and God visits Abraham in a theophany. If you're not familiar with that, that's essentially a manifestation of God as Christ in the Old Testament. And so he visits Abraham with two angels, and he goes into Abraham's tent, this man of faith, 
and he dwells with him, and he talks to him about the future blessing that is to come. But then Lot, who is in Sodom, God is not comfortable going to. He's uncomfortable going to Sodom. And so what does God do? He sends two angels. He doesn't send that manifestation there because he's uncomfortable with it. Again, if he were to come into your life, into your heart, would he be comfortable there? There was a book written years ago with this concept in mind by a man named Robert Munger. It's, it's called uh, Your Heart, Christ's Home. Your Heart, Christ's Home. And it's a fictional tale of Christ coming into this person, this man's life. And, and he has a variety of different rooms that we all have in our homes that represent different spaces internally in us. And so you have the brain and you have the heart and... And, and a variety of different spaces. And so there was the kitchen where things were created and you would enter into the kitchen. And, and so the, the, as the story goes, Christ enters into this man's kitchen and he says, you have, these, these junk, you have this junk food all over the place. You do, this isn't going to make anything good for you. And he, said, he tells him that he needs to get things that are more nutritious. And he explains to him what that means. And he needs to intake nutritious things. And then Christ goes to the library. And he says, you have just... You, you, you have all these, for us, it would be like, you have the social media stuff that, that you're taking inside of you. You have all of this news that you're taking in. You aren't getting anything good information. You're getting garbage in, into you. And, and he said, you got to get rid of all this information and get the right kind of truth in you. And then he goes to the dining room where, where they are satisfying their desires. And he says, you're satisfying the, these desires in a very inappropriate way, and you've got to change that. And then he takes them into the living room, and he says, this social life of yours is not good. You are around people that are bad influences on you. And these people that you are around, you, you need to separate yourself from because they're having more influence on you than you're having on them. And then as he's working through the house, he comes into a hallway where there's a foul odor. And it's there that Jesus says to the man, you need to open this closet. But the man won't do it. And he, and he expresses to him some frustration. He says, I've given you every other part of my being, all of my house. I'm not going to open the door because that's where the secret things were. That's where the things were that he didn't even want Jesus to know about. And Jesus says, you can't have any part of me unless we open this door. You open this door and you let me in there. And the point of the book ends up being, Christ can't dwell in us until we give ourselves to him. But that takes some strength, though, doesn't it? Some inner strength. Because the inner strength leads to the indwelt Christ, which then, which then, and, and this is why we do it. This is why we do it. Then we learn of this incomprehensible love. And I pray that, again, that purpose clause, that, that you being rooted and established in love. So the roots of a tree are deep and important. The foundation of a building has been established. That's what this is communicating to us. May have power together with all the Lord's holy people, so it's not just about you, it's about all of us, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. He, he speaks of us here, again, of an incomprehensible love. Why would anybody open that door that we don't want Jesus to know about if he's just going to judge us or condemn us? Well, you open it because there's this incomprehensible love that that is coming to you, that's coming to me, that then flows through us to others. We need to be known for that kind of love. My friend Caleb Colton back, I, I appreciate how he defines love. He talks about it being the tension between grace and truth. Jesus came to us fully, full of grace and full of truth. Because because the, the, the concept and the, the messaging from the world is that love is just agreeing with what everyone says and saying that what they do is okay. And that, that's not love. That's, that's, that's like some level of unhealthy dependency or something. But that's not love. Love is that, yeah, I don't agree with you, but I'm going to be gracious to you. Okay? And Caleb would speak that message with parents who were actually, he's a pastor and he had parents who were homosexuals and and he's wrestling through that journey, that messy journey with them. And it's a little wild that he was able to keep that relationship intact and be the faithful example that he was while also holding true to the scriptures. But we're to be known as people of love. 
And not necessarily, certainly not as people of hate or people who are out of control or full of rage. I mean, Jesus said that the world will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. And that's, there's something just, there's got to be something to be said for that that doesn't compromise our faith and what is true in the process. And so we're to be known as this kind of love. Now, how do you measure that type of love? He said it's wide and it's high and it's deep and it's long. What does that mean? Well, the breadth of it, he teaches us all this in, in Ephesians. The breadth of it is about Jew and Gentile coming together. That's how wide it is. It was Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 18. The length of it, he tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, is eternity to eternity. The depth is that he would reach into our spiritual depravity, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and pull us out of that death, deathful place. The height is that we are raised up to a heaven, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse, verse 6. And it's at this point, verse 19 tells us, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And so you have an inner strength, you have an indwelt Christ, an indescribable love, and then you have an infinite fullness, infinite fullness of God that's made available to you. One person described it as, as, as God is an ocean. And what is our capacity to allow that to come within us? We often come to God with a thimble to the ocean and we're hoping to have him to experience his fullness. Now obviously we aren't experiencing any of his omnis, omnipresent or omniscience, but we can experience his goodness and godliness that ought to come forth from us. It's the same type of godliness that we see running throughout the scriptures. And it's then as Ephesians 20 verse chapter 3 verse 20 and 21 tell us now to him at this point he is then able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all all generations forever and ever amen and what is the more that that God has given us in the scriptures well Daniel chapter 3 verse 17 it's it's him here who's able to rescue from the fiery furnace Daniel chapter 6 verse 20 through 22 is there that Daniel is saved from the lion's mouth Matthew chapter 9, it's there that Jesus is given, gives sight to the blind. Jude chapter 24, it's there that we learn that we are kept from stumbling. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, it's there that we are saved completely, not partially. And, and then his grace overflows to us. 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 9 verse 8. But the call again for us is, is to, I would argue, repent. It's to repent. We're, we're so focused on these external things that we got to repent and focus our attention back on the Lord. And it's there that, that we see that inner strength and that indwelt Christ and the indescribable love and that, that infinite fullness that can come upon us. It reminds me of an old painting that was painted of Daniel in, in the lion's den. And what's remarkable about the painting is he's not doing what I would be doing. And you look at the painting and you're thinking, oh, that's nice. That's, that's a nice picture. But there's a, there's a deep meaning to it because, again, he's not doing what I would be doing. I would be focused on the lions. But the, but the painter of this, of this wonderful image is communicating to us that Daniel is able to maintain that strength and that composure in this moment because he isn't focused on the lions. He's focused on the Lord. And my encouragement as you come in here today, if you come in here weak, you come in here feeling that God's, he's, he's leaving you hanging. You're not getting more, you're getting less. You're, you're coming in here feeling complacent. You're coming in here wondering like, what is going on? My encouragement is for us to turn and to focus on him, to stop focusing on these, these things that are taking from us. Let's have a word of prayer, and, and it's, our team is going to then lead us into a time of communion and worship. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful and that your love, that your love is indeed so deep and wide and high and long. And Father, I pray that, that we would experience what you've created for us to experience in this life, the life that we are made for, but, but it doesn't come by focusing on those outward things. Instead, it comes by focusing on the inside. And so I pray we would do that. And Lord, help us to turn from, from whatever it is that's, that's wearing us out and, and turn to you. 
It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.